the first session I was establishing what does it mean to be a disciple. And in our context, it is not just having a Bible study or teaching them the basics of Christianity. It's really living with them and being part of who they are. And if you know about Jesus, I think you do know about Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Jesus spent three extensive years with his disciples in all the spheres of their lives. With, uh, you know, some of them, they are mad at him. Don't you care? You're sleeping and we're going to die. Uh, till those uh, one who betrayed him, literally betrayed him. And the other one says, I'm going to die for you. And the moment he gets in trouble, he doesn't even know the Lord and denies him. Uh, he's been, was uh, involved in families and weddings and pain and sickness. Even the two ladies in his life uh, were mad at him because their brother died and he did not come on time. And he didn't think it was, they thought it was too late. So when you do all those things, you're part of the families and the people you work with. You know, I, I go to uh, Kafrakenna. Uh, Kafrakenna is uh, the place where Jesus changed the water into wine. And uh, they still sell the waters of wine. Says this is Jesus' time wine, you know. It's a nice commercial. Yeah. But that was 2,000 years ago. But they still, you know, say this is our town and we've been here and that's where this miracle. And usually the, and when we're talking about the concept of wedding, and if you're in our context, wedding, funerals, kids, anything related to family is an event you attend. Okay? I try when I go home not to attend those events or stay away from them because if I start those events, I will never finish. I will not even do my work when I'm in Egypt uh, because I have so many other commitments. But, you know, this person got, to, you know, your cousin. And I go to the village. It's about 25,000. Half of the village literally is my family. So I go and I sit down and everybody from everywhere. And the fun part is they keep telling you all these relationships. Within an hour, I have no clue who they are. But when you sit down, say, oh, this is the son and the daughter and this of this of this of your cousin, that and that. And, and Okay. It, it's an extensive uh, relationship. And I think that's what Jesus, that's the context where Jesus was. And even the context, you know, of feeding the people and the hungry people. Literally feeding them. Uh, so it's, you know, part of your responsibility as a discipler is to work with all of these issues. And to be part of the people's lives. If the person ends up not having a job, it is our part to help them find a job. I helped, as I said in the first, I helped somebody now go to uh, one country, and from one country to another country because she was being persecuted and forced to, uh, to get married. Uh, but now I'm involved in the other end trying to find my network to get her a job where she is. So, yes, we got her out, but now we have to find a job for her. So these are some of the dynamics you have to be involved in their lives. Unfortunately, in America and in other places, we just restrict discipleship into teaching them the Bible and having two hours every week or every other week to study the Bible, and that's the extent of our discipleship. And I think our American and European churches are not equipped to really do a, a true discipleship, you know, life to life. And also within the context, it's not one person to one person, it's one person to the whole family around. Uh, my family now, after all these years, uh, I still meet with my family and kind of become, even though age-wise I'm the youngest, but the family kind of well elevated me to be the oldest. So I still have good relationship with my family. They have not made the same crossing that I made to the faith. But I still have responsibility. So you can't, when you take me out to become a Christian, it doesn't mean that I lose all my context. I'm still part of that context. This is something weird. Uh, and I'm not, uh, kind of weird in my life. 
my nephew is going, a, uh, going through a divorce. Of course, I don't believe in divorce as a Christian. But somehow he's seeking my wisdom in how to deal with divorce and his kids. He's not a Christian yet, but I'm working with him because we're building relationship, and I'm hoping he will make the commitment. He would not divulge any of this information or ask for this wisdom for anybody else except me. So it tells you that they see what's in your life, and they are affected by it, and they trust it. But in the same time, he doesn't want to make that commitment yet. So this is part of what I said, that disciple starts even before the people are baptized. Do we still have to work with them and spend some time with them? Somebody was telling me he had a re- three years relationship uh, with a person, and they've been talking back and forth, and the person is not really interested at this point to turn to Christ, and he's not interested to turn to, to the other religion. So he said, what do we do? And I answer that because there's some important part that we need to know about. And it's, why is it important? Because sometimes I found workers are more interested in the relationship, so they don't want to mess the friendship. Therefore, they don't force the issue, uh, do you want to follow the Lord? So they are so happy to keep all this friendship, and it's really rich friendship. And if you know the the people are very highly social, you know, uh, social, they like to do things, they like you to do things with them, you become part of their family, an extended family, if you're part of the family. And many people say, you know what, I really don't want to destroy that friendship and share Christ with them and make them make a decision. This is one of the flaws when you talk about friendship evangelism. There's no end to it, and you don't force the people to come to a point to share. Uh, And I think we need to learn there's a point when we ask the person, do you really want to make a decision to follow the Lord? I spent three days, 12 hours a day, with a guy who came to me from Canada to ask questions about Christianity. Three days, 12 hours of negotiation and talking about all the major issues in three days, and he left until now. I don't know if he's even made a commitment. But I've tried to answer all his questions, and I worked on that. Uh, But sometime, that's the end of it. But please, I beg you not to make the friendship is the goal. It is knowing Christ is really the goal. And this is the tension between the evangelicals and the Catholics. The evangelicals are always gung-ho and making a decision for the Lord, but they are very weak in the social side of things. The Catholics are the opposite. They are great at the social side of things, but they never force the issue of following the Lord. So I'm telling you we need to kind of make a balance between all of this in our discipleship. And when you start a relationship, it really involves a lot of other things. Uh, Some of the problems that I will be talking about are not really, uh, not just in the States and other places. But one time I was working in Dearborn and a lady had seven kids. And she was kicked out of her home with the seven kids because her husband found out she, she became a Christian. What do you do in a church suddenly when you have a woman with seven kids? What, where do you put her? Where would she stay? Any ideas? Uh, wonderful. They can stay in my house, but I only have two bedrooms. So we have to put them on the floor somewhere, but we have to do it immediately. We don't have the luxury of looking around, finding a big enough apartment. We have to put them away someplace. And instead of being this way, I actually would become more proactive. The church sits down, sits down, this is the problem that we might be facing. What are we doing to prepare for that? What are our network? And that's where I was telling the young lady from Chicago, I had an urban uh, degree, urban ministry degree, where you have the network already going, you know how to deal with issues of unemployment, immigration, this and this and this and that, 
So when some problems you have, you know whom to call. Okay? And you have a roster. I don't know if United Way still does that booklet that has all the numbers and addresses of the different nonprofit organizations and how they serve. I had that booklet, and if you don't have it, make one, just in case if you have to deal with the issues of unemployment and other things that you need to, have to know the right people. So that's part of the preparation before this even happens. Okay? So if you get some other issues, you already have an idea. And actually, we had a house of an older couple who has a big house, and their kids already moved on, and they had four bedrooms. So we managed to put that lady in that house. So this is part of the, the things that we deal with and we work with. We have challenges that we face. You have historical challenges. You have theological challenges. You have psychological challenges. You have sociological challenges. You have economical challenges. And you have religious challenges. Uh, these are different areas when we work with people and disciple them. You have to deal with a lot of these challenges. And some of it is out of your hand because that's the history. Uh, and that's when I'll, I'll get to do, to do a little more on that. Uh, the psychological issue, the lady that I was working with and I told you we helped her escape, she came from, and this is what we don't understand sometimes in the West. She really came from... You know, I'm Presbyterian, okay? I'm not charismatic. But when you know the family has satanic environment in it, I know some of you may disagree with me, but if you come from some of these cultures, there are some places that still practice satanic practices. And you know it in the way they deal with the people. And that lady came from a family like this. And they, I mean, when you go into some of these homes, you feel with a whole wall on your shoulder and your heart is so heavy. There is a presence of evil. Again, I don't go to every house. I don't get demons out and so on. That's not my practice. But I can tell you it does exist in our cultures, even in America, with some of these homes. And we need to differentiate and we need to be prepared for literal spiritual warfare. Even in America and in Europe, I've seen some. I've been in homes like this. So we need to be prepared. And our workers, unfortunately, when we send them away, we don't prepare them for this. We don't tell them that you're going to be in some areas and some places. In Morocco, there's some areas and some cities well known for that. If you're going to go do ministry in there, you're going to have to be facing those kind of issues. And they are known, and the people know them. But it's a different experience. So you need to also be prepared. Uh, I was in uh, Algeria, and I was talking to young ladies, and one of them started screaming in my face. I got scared because everybody going to think I've done something to her. And I said, what to do, what to do? And somehow the Holy Spirit... It reminded me, anything you know about the power of Jesus just starts spouting out those verses. So I put my hand on her, and every verse in Arabic and in English I said, and within 20 minutes she fell down. She was demon-possessed. Okay, again, folks, I am Presbyterian. I could be Baptist. I don't believe in those things. But sometimes when the Lord puts you in the middle of those things, you've got to react. I don't go to everybody who says, let me pray for you. You know, to do this, no. But there are some things that happens that I have to deal with. And I learn through these. So we need to be more flexible and our theological box a little bit more open. Because you deal with all kinds of cultural issues uh, in there. Uh, psychological issues. Uh, many of the young people around the world have many psychological issues and I deal with them, and especially when you become a Christian, then you are forced to do things, you are, you know, uh, kicked out of your family, your society. Uh, so we have some families who told them, you're dead to us, 
you leave the house and you're done. We don't want you. We don't want to hear of you. You're not our daughter anymore. I think you heard from one of the speakers. Sometimes we have a, what we call schizophrenia, especially with the young women who had to stay at home with their family. They end up being praying as a Muslim in their family. But then every Sunday they go to church and pray as a Christian. And they keep both lives. It's a schizophrenia. They keep both lives because they're afraid if they tell their family something's going to happen to mom and dad. And so they don't want to do that. But they still want to keep their Christian faith. And you have that dualism that they live in. If you don't get them out of this, uh, they will live a life that is schizophrenic. And that's a problem. Uh, my opinion that the theological issues or the theological differences in discipleship is much easier than the sociological ones. Dealing with family and identity and I, is more difficult than understanding Christ and who he is mentally and accepting that. So that's much easier sometimes than the society and dealing with, with the society. I remember one of the things when I left my home country and I went to America, I used to sit next to the wall and I cried because I missed my family and my close-knit uh, community. And I was in America alone, didn't have that many ties. I love America, but American individualism killed me. Everybody have their own. You can have a neighbor for 30 years and you never know who that their name and where they're coming from. And I'm not used to that. I needed a community. It was very difficult for me. Uh, even the food was difficult. You have a lot of starch in your food. I missed some of that, you know, organic, naturally organic. Not the kimchi, but in Korea, you know, it's an organic fermentation. Uh, uh, but, you know, so there's some things you missed and your diet changes. All of that becomes an issue uh, for you and you miss your family. Uh, when you have disciples who become a Christian, now they lost their job. Maybe not in uh, Europe, maybe in not other places. Uh, but they force them to leave their job, at least in the part of the world where we come from. They kick you out of your job. So now you have to disciple them, but they also have to help them financially. I had a friend of mine, he was a good guy, nice, has a great heart, but he ended up putting up $25,000 to help one family in different things. Oh, they wanted a computer. They wanted this. You want to go from this apartment to this apartment. They wanted to furnish the new apartment. And on and on and on. And it becomes problem. Because that becomes a liability and dependability. Anytime they need some money, please go to Uncle Richmond and get some money. You have to help them, but you can't build dependency because you have so much money. And eventually that family <laughs> turned back to their own. Why? Because they were spoiled. And in the end, there was no commitment. Anything they wanted, they got. So it was a flimsy relationship. And when they put some more pressure on them, they were gone. So yes, you have to help economically, and you need to put that in your budgets before you start ministry. What are we going to do? If that person has to leave, we have a strategy. If that person has to leave physically their home within half an hour, because they're going to kill that person, or you're going to take that lady and do something wrong to her. Okay? Do we have a plan and contingency to take that family or to take that person and to put them in the safe place. So we have to think of safe places. So all of that ahead of time, folks. We're not waiting to react. But we have a strategy that we have two or three homes that we can take those people to. If they need a home immediately. We also need a vehicle to respond fast, to go pick them up with family and kids and so on and put them in another place that is safe. That's part of the strategy if you're going to be involved in this. So it's not just teaching them about Jesus and the Bible. It's also how you deal with them in the time of emergency. That's planned in a strategy. So all of that has to be in. The political issues still become problematic. Uh, Europe has been taking a lot of Syrian ahead of everybody else. So Angela Merkel, the former uh, prime minister of Germany, 
was forced to renege in the agreement with the Afghanis and Southeast Asian refugees to send them back because there was a lot of pressure on her not to take refugees anymore because there are a million of them that came to Germany. So they put a lot of political pressure, so they had to send some of the Afghanis back and keep the Syrian. That's a political issue. Political issue in the country and political issue that the poor Afghanis now are not the desired one, they sent them back, but the Syrians were in right now. And we had a lot of good Iraqis who, when they came in, they said, we are Syrians. And when they had the Iraqi issues, we had Syrians who were coming, they are Iraqis. And since we don't know the difference in language between the two, people got away with it. So this is a, a political issue, and you have to deal with it. Now they're not accepting Iraqis, but you have Iraqis coming. Or now they're accepting Iraqis and not Syrians. So that's all part of the politics. Even when you bring them in, even within our communities, these are Sunni and these are Shiites. You have in Dearborn, it used to be Lebanese Shiites, but they don't get along with the Iraqi Shiites. So there's Iraqi Shiite mosque and Lebanese Shiite mosque, and they don't work together as two ethnic groups, even though both of them are Shiites. But again, so you get the Sunni and the Shiites, and these guys respond differently, and you have to deal with them. That's a political issue as well as sociological issues. I thought I know about Islam. I didn't because I only know the Sunni Islam. And then when I was in Dearborn, I learned about the Shiite Islam, and I had to restudy a lot of things to be able to minister to them. So you need to understand what kind of person you're working with. The Yemenis are a whole different ballpark. They have different issues and different things, and you have to deal with them different than the rest of the group. And you have quite a few in Dearborn that are available. Uh, I, I just gave uh, a talk in Egypt on the new contextualized translation. Okay, Now people are being bombarded by different translations and when you do the discipleship which translation are you going to use the newest translation now that is highly contextualized and problematic in my opinion when you take Jerusalem and you put down Al-Quds which is the Arabic Islamic name for the holy city Al-Quds instead of Jerusalem because now you fuse the Islamic history into a biblical history just by changing the word so uh, the people would understand the Quds is closer to Muslims and they understand it politically. But then you're fusing the Islamic Jerusalem with the old Jerusalem and you get a problem and you have to explain that problem. They've also taken baptism out and put the word purification which is highly problematic. And when they did that, now they never understood what purification means even in Islam and putting the word and translating it in that way. Purification, by the way, in Islam means circumcision of the boys. Okay? The second problem, it's used when the husband and wife have intercourse and therefore, he cannot pray. He has to take a shower to be able to pray. And that's also called purification. Now, we have a problem. Because that is not baptism, is it? You know, I, I thought about it. You know what is the closest, and I can't translate it this way, but the Islamic shahada is the closest to baptism. Why? What is baptism in our circles? It's an external confession about an internal belief. So you tell the people outside that you are following Jesus Christ and you're going to continue to follow him in a public way. So you're really affirming your faith in front of the people. That's what the shahada does. But I'm not going to take baptism and put the shahada instead because that's a whole different, because the shahada would say there's no God but Allah and the rest of it then we got a problem. 
So that is, even the translation could get you in trouble. Which one would you use? So you need to be careful and find out some of these. Uh, like in North Africa, they use the word Isa instead of Jesus, Yeshua in there. But the Bible they use is the one that's similar to the Middle East, which uses Yeshua. But in their preaching, they use Isa. The Persians don't have that problem. They don't even use the word Allah. They use Khuda, which is uh, the same as God. Some people now are mad at Allah's name and, uh, and they say, well, we should take it out of our Arabic Bible. We should put another one. Uh, well, but the word Allah was before Islam, 600 years before Islam was used among the Christian. And it was Allah the Father, Allah the Son, and Allah the Holy Spirit. And she, here you have about 35 million Arab speaking who have been doing that for hundreds of years. And then you come in from America, come with the theory, we can't use the word Allah. I do the benediction in the name of Allah. But not Allah, the solo Allah of Islam, but Allah the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it creates issues, even the translation now. So we really got to be careful which translation we're going to use and how it helps us. And I'd rather we don't change things dramatically, but at least explain them. If they're not understood, we explain them. Who is the difference between Isa and Yeshua. Uh, he says only a prophet in Islam. No more, no less. See the point? He's not the son of God. He's only a prophet. So when you start putting using that word, you need to understand that the people who are listening know the difference. That he's beyond the prophet. He's a prophet, he's a priest, he's a king, he's the son of God. But if you put that name, it is limited understanding in that culture. That means he's only a prophet. So we say Muhammad is a prophet, Jesus is a prophet, Moses is a prophet, David is a prophet. That's it. So then Jesus loses his uniqueness and who he is if he's just equal prophet to the rest. I hope I'm not confusing you uh, with all of this. So even the translation that we use in the discipleship, we need to be careful which one. I mean, even in America, we have the same issue. You know, God, he and she now. You know, with some of these translations. And they, they're going to try all kinds of things for the culture to change. And we have to deal with those issues. God doesn't have sex, by, by the way. He has, actually, if you study a good uh, study of God in the Old Testament and New Testament, God is used in different ways, sexually, male and female. Because he is not either. He is inclusive of all of that. We are having issues with the names nowadays and the definitions of names and things. As I said in the first session, how you define a woman? The one who gets pregnant. That's one of the definition. Did you hear that? The woman is defined that she's the one who can pre you know, get pregnant. Uh, that's it. But you can't say who is a woman because you can't define her. Or you get another definition. And by the way, I'm African-American. And actually more African-American than the African-American because I was born in Africa, I speak an African language, and I lived in Africa, and I came to America. Maybe I should run for a Congress as an African-American candidate. People kind of look at me, oh, that's weird. No, because there's white people in Africa and South Africa and other places, and all the North Africa, we are all Africans and speak African language. So in America, we decide, we, you know, we decide that by color. For us, we decided, but who lived in Africa and speak an African language and came to America? So again, our culture defines things for us. And when you work with the people, you also have to define things to help them understand what are the definitions and who is Jesus. Uh, I don't want to get messy here, but... How many of you teach in Sunday school or have been taught in Sunday school about persecution? Do you know that the New Testament, but three books, are all talking about persecution? When we do training for our leaders, we train them in persecution. The really good people who have a good handle on this are the Chinese. 
they know how to be persecuted, how to deal with persecution, uh, and tell you how to jump from the second floor to the first floor without breaking your leg, how to avoid and how to say things that not to get you in trouble. So I had a friend of mine uh, got stopped in Algeria, and they asked him, do you baptize Muslims? What would he say? What would you say if you got stopped in the airport? What would you say? He said, no, which is true. I don't baptize Muslims. I baptize Christians or Muslims have become Christians. So therefore, I don't baptize Muslims. I baptize Christians. And this is how the Holy Spirit gave him the wisdom to get out of trouble in the airport. God gives us the wisdom in the difficult times, and he gives you the way. I was two minutes from being kidnapped in Gaza. And if it wasn't one student, it wasn't me, by the way. It was another person that they're going to kidnap. They would have got me for free. They got it two for the, you know, for the price of one. And I was going to go with him to university uh, to teach with him. And one of the student columns says, they are planning to kidnap you. Just to two minutes before we were supposed to go downstairs and had our luggage ready and to take a taxi and go there. We ended up staying in the hotel. Two minutes. So there's some things that God helps us and protects us and the Holy Spirit gives us the wisdom what to say and what not to say. So these are some of the things that we need to prepare our people. You're going to be persecuted. How are you going to deal with it? What would happen if you go to a jail? How many of you are ready to go to jail for the decision that you made to help some of the BMBs? They have to be ready for that. They have to prepare for that. We did a whole course, by the way, in what is persecution biblically and how do you deal with persecution and what kind of organization are dealing. I know one of the sponsors is Middle East Concern for this conference. I'm part of their board. And they deal with all this issue of persecution of people in our part of the world to help them out. You need to know how to do a press release. Uh, we had some issues in Saudi Arabia, but we could not do a press release and to confirm that these people uh, issues and they have become Christian. So what do we do with that? We put an internal pressure on the authorities to release them. It took them nine months to be released. Other places we have to do direct pressure. This is part of how you deal with persecution, biblically and logistically. As I said before, do you have a house to take the people before they get caught and put them in some safe place? That's part of the strategy in how you deal with persecution. They also you need to do that. They need to understand this before they get baptized. That this is the price, mostly the price in our context, for that. Some people don't get persecuted. Not everybody gets persecuted. They get persecuted in different ways. Uh, we don't hear of somebody dying maybe once in a while. We just heard of one young lady that her death threw her out down from three floors down and killed her because she became a Christian. But the majority of this, those things don't happen. I mean, some people do, but others don't. But it does happen. Uh, some guy, the, uh, well, that young lady, actually, that I told you that I, tried, I helped, her cousins put poison in her food to kill her. And something happened, she didn't eat. So they deliberately did that. So again, when we talk about persecution, folks, we need to understand what we're working with. Some of our culture never had to deal with those issues of becoming Christian. But we need to deal with them. Now, how are you helping them out? You need to sit down as a church and as a community, as a ministry. How are we going to do with, uh, deal with that? The Chinese church is dealing with all these things in and out with all the persecution. And by the way, when you get persecuted, Christianity grows. You know we have more than 2 million believers now in Iran? All underground. Why? Because persecution leads to church growth. In the former president of Algeria, they opened legally 37 churches, Muslim convert churches. The new leadership are closing them down. 
they don't understand if you close them down, they're going to grow in the homes and they'll be bigger than being in one place. But they don't understand that, so they close them down. And now they are growing more than they've grown before. Because now they are growing the home. And even in Iran, you bust one, two, twenty house churches. There are more than twenty house churches everywhere. So this is part of the Christian life. And believe it or not, here in America, we're starting to face persecution for being Christians. Not directly. I just did a whole talk in my church about the beginning of persecution in America. So don't just feel, oh, they are safe. You know, we are safe. They are bad in China. They are bad in Iran. They are bad in other places, but not here. It's coming here, too. It's coming to town. In Canada. Where's Canada? Africa? Anybody tells me where Canada is? They're closer to Michigan. Two hours, and you cross through the winter, you know, or take the tunnel or uh, take the bridge, and you're there. Two hours. They are imprisoning pastors who say anything preaching about Islam or against Islam, even in the pulpit. They are put in jail. There are some Indian pastors who have been put in jail for that. They are a little bit ahead of us. Okay? That's called now the sin of defamation. So you have some of these issues that's coming to America. Are we ready for that? I don't want to spend the whole course talking <laughs> about uh, persecution, but this is an ingredient in teaching and discipleship and preparing the people for that. The nature of God, when you do that, uh, we really need to refurbish, reclean. You know, uh, when you get a computer, you know, an old one, and you have to refurbish it and clean it out and so on and have it like new, but it's not new. Uh, with the people, we need to refurbish, we need to clean out their original understanding of who God is and replenish it and refurnish it with a new understanding of the biblical God. That is very important. I usually start with this because the nature of God affects the salvation of God. Why is God saving us, folks? Huh? What does uh, John 3.16 say? Because God's is love, and part of his attribute is love. And because of that love, he sent his son, his only begotten son, to die for us. But if God is not love, he would not do that. He will punish us and without loving us. So you really have to start anew and explain who is the biblical God and how God deals with us. I tell you, when I was a child, I did not look at heaven. I was more scared of hell. And all the stories that, you know, I don't like gory movies, American gory movies. You know, with the eyes melt and the skin melts. And that's what we hear as kids. This is what happens in hell. Your skin melts, your eyes fall down, and you burn, and you feel the burn, and then God puts them back on again, and you go through on, and it's eternal hell and fire and damnation. I was more afraid of hell than I love heaven. Okay? So this is one of the issues. Is the God of hell, or is he a God of salvation and love? Are we scared of God? That's why we follow Jesus. We love God, therefore... And we love Jesus, therefore we follow. So you really need to work on that to redo our understanding of who God is. Okay? So for the Muslims, God can change his mind, by the way. In the end of days, if he decided that you, Scott, go to heaven, he said, well, no, I don't like Scott. Scott goes to hell. It's up to God if he wants to do that. Wonderful, isn't it? God can do capriciously whatever. Even though Scott is a good man, he's done good life, he lived a good life, he did all the Islamic things, but God decided, no, I don't want him there. That's the nature of God, folks. That he's not consistent. So we need to deal with this issue in our uh, discipleship. As I told you, I had to do some training with the Yemenis about marriage and about who is a woman. A woman is a sexual object that needs to be covered. Where did you find that in the Bible? Not in the Bible. 
It's an, another view that they have learned and what we call the Arabic aura, that she is a sexual thing that needs to be covered. Even her voice should not be heard in public. So we should not hear the woman's voice, and therefore you have to cover up the woman. You know why? Because man does not sin when he sees women wearing short skirts. So all of that for the benefit of who? For man. So man does not sin. This is a problem. Who is a woman? Is she an object of man? So God has to, even when they say the woman is insufficient in religion. You know why? Because in Islamically, because she has the period. Okay. Um, let me ask you women. Why do we have the period? What is the benefit of the period? You don't know? To have children. It's a blessing, isn't it? God created you that way. Creatively that way so you can have children. So why are you punished religiously for being a woman? And having this natural... You see the point? So she can't practice and pray if she has this time. Which is, that's the craziness. That the, who is a woman? So now when you come biblically, how do you define a woman? When she was created from the rib, that rib was crooked, by the way. And therefore, a woman was created from a crooked crick, uh, rib. What does that tell you? The value of a woman. She's crooked from the beginning. You see what I'm saying? So these are some of the things that they've been taught... Now let's look at it biblically. A bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. That was the first love song and poetry in the Old Testament. She's part of me. And she says, I'm not complete without another person. Everybody had other things and animals and so on except man was alone. God wanted to complete man with someone exactly from him, equal to him. See the difference in that training and the difference when you do Bible study, who is a woman? I know, I know the Christians say, oh, it's, it's all the woman's fault, she's the one who told Adam to do what. But didn't Adam hear the story with the woman too about what's going on? And he heard that we shouldn't eat from that tree. Only the woman heard it, isn't it? Man, Adam did not know the story. Help me, you scholars now of the Old Testament. Both of them know. Both of them know the prohibition. He should have known because he responsible for her. He should have said, no, we shouldn't do that because God said so. She fell and he fell. It's not Adam's fault and it's not Eve's fault. It's their disobedience. But they are equal in many ways. And I tell you, this is the biblical story. This is the equality. It is not that she's less than a man. She's equal to a man. She's just different. And this is what we need when we talk about family. Why would I marry one wife and instead of four? Well, they come back to me and say, well, Solomon married thousands. So why are you not picking on Solomon's and picking on us? What is the biblical answer for that? I don't want to get an apologetic. But when you get to do discipleship, you have to deal with those things. How do you explain that? Why do we only marry one wife? Well, for me, uh, one wife is better than four. I can say yes, dear, to one. I can't say yes, dear, to four of them. And that means I'm going to have four mothers-in-law as well who are involved. And in our culture, the mothers-in-law could live with you. Okay? We don't have the separation in America. They could come and live with you. And I tell you, I was counseling a couple, one Arab and uh, his wife was American. So they were getting ready to get married, so they looked at a house, and they were says, oh, this is our house, this is the one we like, we're going to buy this, and we're going to live in it when, when we get married. So the Arab man, I got him in the counseling session, the Arab man went and asked his family, because we do, when we go buy a house, we want the family to bless the house and to look at it. This is a small house. But if your uncle and aunt and such and such come to live with you, they have no place to live. This is a small house. You need a bigger house. 
So he went back to his fiance and said, you know what? Uh, this house is too small for us. He says, why? He says, my parents said so, but who's buying the house and who's living in it? Your parents or me? Now we got a problem. And I had to do some counseling to explain to her how the Arabs buy a house and the family is involved in that and how we buy a house to be independent and have their own home in the West, in America. Okay? That's a cultural issue that's happening. So even how you define a house and a home, they want family, is part of your family, so you need to have a bigger house to do that. All of that, all, all of these issues are in. Is my time up? You let me know who's keeping time. For ten more minutes? All right, I get ten minutes grace. I will uh, stop here and give you some time for questions. Any questions? Have I been that good that there is no questions? You're my friend, Scott. Ask a question so I feel like I'm relevant here. No, just kidding. No questions? Should I? Go ahead. You had. Yeah. What was the most significant and memorable discipleship experience that you had? Oh, there's so many, Scott. Eh. I was blessed. One of the main differences that when I became a Christian, I joined a young people's group and we did a small Bible study. And I took Christianity with them and like DTS, you know, was used to the mission. So I took it from its beginning to the end. Most of the people that I know do not go through discipleship like this, unfortunately. And as I said the first session, their experience is only their testimony. I know only of two other women in all the BMBs that I know who have been discipled well by other people. And they are superb in the Bible. And they know their Bible, they live their life, and they are more mature than other people that I know. As I said, the two women that I said in the first session, after four years being in church, did not even know what's the Old Testament and New Testament, how to open uh, the Bible, didn't have a Bible, so they downloaded it and, uh, on the phone, and somebody explained to them what's Old Testament and New Testament after four years of being a Christian. In a Dutch church, here we're not talking about the Middle East that they have no access, or North Africa. No, these were in the Western churches that are supposed to be discipling them. Uh, so for me, that's the, made the difference in my life and the ability. And also, my theological training. I wanted to be a missionary. I did not want to go to seminary. I really refused. And there was a Christian Reformed pastor yeah, who's uh, Syrian, Bassem Madani. He's in the 90s now. He said, you need to finish your theological training. You need to uh, learn how to explain theologically, articulate theologically what you believe in. I went kicking and screaming. But in the other end, it has helped me tremendously in my teaching in explaining in a simple way, theologically, to other BMBs, how to do things and so on. Uh, so that really was a blessing for me uh, to do that. Uh, so that's for me personally. That really helped my maturity and so on. Any other question? Seminary, we kicking and screaming too? Yes. And it wasn't because I didn't like Calvin Seminary. And the question was, was it Calvin Seminary that you were kicking and screaming? It was any seminary I would have kicked and screamed. But because I was living in Grand Rapids, that was the closest to go and part of the Christian Reformed. And I actually loved to be a Reformed person, and especially Kuyperian theology and the Kingdom theology. Uh, that's where I believe in when I did my uh, doctorate degree was on that. 
understanding that it's a holistic approach. It's a kingdom of God, not the church as the center, but the kingdom of God. And that really left an impact on my teaching and my discipleship and my theological understanding as a holistic way and not a, a particular way. So I, I am, you know, I own that. Uh, and I'm like, yes, the person from Bangladesh. <clears throat> I have a question about Allah because um, there are a um, lot of debate and discussion between Allah and God. Yes. Because uh, sometimes we hear the pastors or speakers say that uh, God and Allah are not the same. They are different because God said or declared that this is my son yeah. and listen to him. But Allah never said that this is my son. Okay. And uh, so there are lot, lots of debate. Well, you haven't heard what I said though. What did I say? Some of the first things that we do is refurbish the understanding of God. And uh, there was a, a debate between Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin. With general revelation, seeing the world around you, enough to bring you to the saving knowledge of Christ. Thomas Aquinas says yes. Calvin said no. Calvin said you need the spectacles of Christ to understand God fully and clearly. Allah is not God. But it's the word has been used and needs to be redefined as the same as we defined it in a biblical way. And that's what I said. That's why we do the refurbishing and redoing the whole understanding of who God is biblically with them. But now, let me turn it back on you. What is G-O-D? It used to be gods and goddesses, wasn't it? We just been very funny, uh, capitalized the G, and we said, this is the Christian God. Or did we define, redefine G-O-D? You answer me. You have the same problems we have in Allah. The other issue that goes with that. What's the word in Greek, theos? Where does it come from? Zeus. Theos, Zeus. But is it Zeus or we have redefined biblically the word theos? So if you're having a problem with Allah, you better have a problem with God and theos. Because we've done the same thing. Why? Because the word God was known to us in our society. Therefore, we redefined it and had a word that's known to us. From the Germans and the Dutch and the others and became gods and goddesses became just proper God, G-O-D. Okay? So we've done the same thing. And Theos, the Greeks, did the same thing. The Greek believers, they used and redefined Theos. So we have the same problem. We need to use a word locally that is used. And I hear I'm speaking as an Arab. We have used Allah before Muslims even came to the being. 600 years before Islam even appeared. And the word was Allah there. Okay? And Muhammad, his name is Muhammad, son of Ab Abdullah, the slave of Allah. So even Muhammad had his name before he became a prophet as his, grand, grand, his father was Abdullah. The slave of Allah. And in that time, Allah was used in a whole different manner. Allah, by the way, had three daughters. That's the time of Islam. Alati wunat wal uzza. Walat from Allah, the female Allah. So when Muhammad came, they were talking about different uh, deities that they worship with their statues and, and they worship them. It was a whole different. So Islam came and redefined it in the Islamic way as one and only. Okay? It's not, not the same. But we use the same word, like gods and goddesses, and we have a capital G and redefine our understanding. That's what the Arab has done. Okay? So now, for some American philosophers and ideas and theoricians, they come 2,000 years after we've been using the word Allah in Christianity and the Arab Christians, 
and say, no, you guys have been worshiping the wrong God, that's a problem. That's arrogance. Because you have the same sin. You've done the same thing with God and Theos. And so why are you telling us that we have that? We don't believe in God, the only non-Trinitarian God. That's not the God we worship. And when I do it in Arabic, Allahul Ab, Allahul Ibn, Allahul Ruh Al-Qudus. God the Father, Allah the Father, Allah the Son, Allah the Holy Spirit. We believe in that. That's the Allah we understand 600 years before even Islam came. That's the kind of things that we need to be informed in. The Persian made it easier. Instead of using Allah, they used Khuda in their translation. And uh, time is up. And the others use also different forms of Allah. Not Allah, but different God. So don't get lost in the debate who Allah, Allah and God. It's really who is Allah. Who is the God that we worship. It's, if it is without Jesus, then that's not the same God. We have to have the spectacles of Jesus. And mean that's the God incarnate. To understand and have a relationship with God fully. Does that articulate enough the answer? Or he's still not convinced? Yes, the meaning of Allah. That's why I said we need to refurbish the first thing, who, who is God. Uh, can I pray? Uh, yes. Well, Hebrew is a little bit different. I wish we used the word, uh, the word Jehovah of Yahweh. But the problem is, in Judaism, they will never use the personal name of God uh, as you say Yahweh. They always substitute it with the word Adonai. Okay? Because it was a personal name of God that should not be used in public. So they always read it as Adonai, but never say Yahweh. Only Moses, because that was the personal name of God. And God says, I am who I am, Yahweh. Okay? But also the Old Testament has different names for God. Because it has different attributes of God. El Shaddai, Elohim, Adonai. Okay? So while the New Testament really doesn't have a variety of names of God. Some of you are scholars there. They have no variety of God. We have no different names in some sense of God. There's only one name in the New Testament that we, which is to us and we define it. So, but in the Old Testament, God had different names during his times and the way he treated people. And even the people had different names according to how God wanted to use them. Like Jacob becomes Israel. And Abraham becomes Abraham. Uh, these were done for a reason. So the Old Testament, I wish we had Elohim, but again, uh, sorry, Yahweh, but again, that was not used in public. And the Jewish people, even till now, would not use uh, the name in public. They would always say Adonai. Thank you for your time. May God bless you. And use you. I hope I was a help to you.